I want to talk to you today. Uh, we're continuing our series of the Heroes of Faith series out of Hebrews 11. We're going to be talking today about Moses. We're going to be talking to, uh, about Moses today. And as you look in the back of your bulletin, it says the big question. God had a question for Moses. And so I want to encourage you. Uh, how many brought your Bible today? How many got a bulletin? How many got something where you can write? If you don't have a bulletin, you can have this one. You can write on it. Because the things you're going to hear today is the Word of God that we need to respond to. I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Numbers chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 1 to 20. Hold on here. We're going to be reading. 23. Numbers 1. Actually, chapter 11, verses 1 to 23. I'm going to start reading. Now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of that place. My pulpit just broke. Well, I can always hit baseball with this one. We'll glue it. The name of that place, Taborah, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Verse 4, now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is being dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its color like the color of bedellium. The people went about and gathered it, ground it on, on millstones to beat, or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans, and made cakes of it. And its taste was like the taste of pastry, prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you, why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? Yet you have laid the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to our, their fathers? Where am I going to get meat to give to all these people? For well, they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. I'm not going to be able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my own wretchedness. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there, I will take up the spirit that is upon you and put the same upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. Then you shall say to the people, consecrate yourself for tomorrow that you shall eat meat for you have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat for it is well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have despised the Lord who is among you, and you have wept before him, saying, Why did we ever come out of Egypt? And Moses said, The people whom I am and Moses said, The people whom I I am among are six hundred thousand men on foot. Yet you have said, 
I will give them meat that they may eat it for a whole month. Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to provide enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together to, for them to provide enough for them? Here is the question that God asked Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, Has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. A serious but sober but even funny description of what was going on in this chapter. What was going on in this chapter? Well, obviously, it's about the children of Israel leaving Egypt, their journey of faith, and at this moment they didn't see it as faith. But Moses, under his leadership, in this chapter, two things are happening, and you need to see the big picture of this. Two things were happening. Two things that were going on. Number one, God's miracle provision for them, the manna and then the meat. The other thing that was going was that God was getting ready to help Moses because he alone was bearing all the responsibility, him and his brother um, Aaron and Miriam, their sister, which was the prophetess. But that wasn't enough. And so what was happening in this chapter that God was showing Israel, I love you despite all your complaining, all of your whining and griping and everything else, I love you with my long-suffering and my patience that I'm going to provide not only the uh, manna, and the description of it, but also the meat that was coming to them. Can you? This was over. Listen, this was over a million and a half people. Think about it. Because it says six hundred thousand men. They had wives. They had children. So it's between one and a half million to two million people. And Moses was frustrated. He was angry, and he was saying, God, how are you going to do this? But the other thing was, God says, I'm going to take of the spirit that is upon you, Moses, and these 70 men whom you know to be elders of the people, I'm going to put, take a measure of the spirit and put it upon each one of them. And they're going to help you lead the people. So all this was going on at one time. The people complained. Well, let me just say this about the authority that the 70 were given. First of all, they were going to be giving authority by God and also prophetic anointing. Say it again. They were going to be given authority by God to lead the people, but also prophetic anointing to speak forth the word of the Lord because they all prophesied. And this was God's sovereign plans and choosing. We see the complaining about their situation by the people. The God that had delivered them, took care of them, protected them, they responded with anger and ungratefulness. You think we could ever respond in that way to God? The food, that manna that, that came six days a week and they could rest one day and then the, that Saturday or that Sabbath, before the Sabbath, they gathered enough for two days. The Bible says in Isaiah 78 that this description is called angel's food. Isaiah, excuse me, Psalm 78 describes the manna as angel's food, not angel's food cake. That's probably where it came from. Angel's food in Psalm 78, which tells me this. This was the food that angels eat in heaven. So now that, that, that clears things up is what, what do angels eat. What did angels eat? Angels' food. God gave them the food of angels, and it was enough to take care of themselves. And so they complained. They weren't happy. Verse 4 says there was a mixed multitude, which means they were not of Israel that were part of the group. They probably came out of Egypt or heard about what God was doing for Israel. They had joined themselves to Israel, a mixed multitude, and it says that they gave in to the attitude of lusting and it affected the children of Israel. And I want to say this to you. Be careful who you hang with. Be careful who you hang with. 
because their attitude can have a real effect on you. It can happen at work. It can happen in your neighborhood. It can even happen in your family. Not everyone's going to have faith. Not everyone's going to have the faith to believe God and want to serve God. So you've got to be careful, brothers and sisters, about other people's attitudes. Because it can have an effect upon you. One of the things was was the unbelief that this group brought to Israel. They were having Israel was having a hard time with their own attitudes, but this even made it worse, this mixed multitude. Because pretty soon you're going to believe and you're going to act just like them. And with the people crying and complaining, and, and Moses again out of his frustration. And fighting his own discouragement. He was frustrated and he was fighting discouragement. And he said as we read. Why did you choose me to lead this people? He said I can't carry this burden. Now just kill me. You ever heard someone say. All right God just take me home. I'm ready to die. Life is terrible. And I believe the lie. So I want to die. And I'm going to have a big cry. You you know anybody that's ever done that? Please don't raise your hand. (laughs) This is where Moses was. He was frustrated and angry. But God didn't take him up on that. God says, I'm going to give you some help. Go get the 70 men ready. I'm going to meet with you at the tabernacle and my presence is going to come. I'm going to help you shepherd this one and a half to two million people. And Moses said, how can you get all this meat? We're going to get all this fish from the sea. We're going to kill all of our cows and sheep that we brought from from Egypt, and we won't have anything then. How's it going to happen, God? How's it going to happen? He had a question to God. And you know, and I've read you the scripture, what God said. And this is the key point of my message to you this morning. Look what the Lord said again in that 23rd verse. And the Lord said to Moses, Has the Lord's arm been shortened? Has the Lord's arm been shortened? What he's basically saying is, Moses, I haven't changed. Maria said it a little earlier in communion time about we've got God in a box. We've got him in a box. And he can do only this, but the rest of it, I don't know if he can do that in my life. Because we've got God in the box. And God says, has has my arms been shortened? Have I been diminished in any way? Have I, the Lord God, been diminished toward you and this people in any way? See, this same question is the same question. See, it's both a question and an answer. Because he said, now you shall see. Look at your Bible. Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. Now you're going to see me. That's God's mercy. Even in the midst of whining and complaining and irritated and grouchy and just in a bad place. Even with the manna and the meat that was going to come. God says, in my mercy, I'm going to show you that my arms are not short and you're going to see what I can do in your life. I haven't changed. We need to think about this for a minute. You remember what I did just a few months ago? Didn't I split the Red Sea open and let you walk through it to escape your enemies? Didn't I bring ten plagues upon Egypt so you could come out of that place in a deliverance? Did I not, in Psalm 78, I encourage you to read that this week, God split rocks open. And if you ever were with us that, when we showed that video of In Search of the Real Mount Sinai, I don't know if if any of you were here when we showed it, they actually found the place, not in Egypt, but in Saudi Arabia, this place. And there is the, <clears throat> talked about the split rock of Oreb. 
on that mountain with a scorch and they found it? That for that type of rock to be as smooth as it was, it would have taken millions of gallons of water. It's still there. They found it. If you ever want to watch that video, it's amazing that they let us find this in the, in the country of Saudi Arabia. They have it and it's still untouched with all the stuff. I didn't want to digress, but I'm telling you that God split rocks open. God protected them. God led them by the cloud by day and the fire by night. And this is what their attitude was. Let me tell you something. Faith rewards will come, but you're going to be tested in your faith. You're going to be tested to see if you'll trust the Lord. Or are you going to go back into your own devices and your own way of handling things? How many have found that out this year? How many of you found out that you've been tested? You've been tested. Isaiah 59.9 says, excuse me, 59.1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. Look at it. Behold, the Lord's hand hand is not shortened that he cannot save nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you that he will not hear see the word save first of all he says behold the Lord's hand is not shortened say not shortened with me not shortened, that he cannot save. The word save there is a Hebrew word, yasha. The Hebrew word yasha, the word save. And you want to write this down. It means yasha, the word save. It means to be open. Is God's arm short to you or is his hand closed to you? No. It means to be open. It means to be saved. It means to free. It also means to defend. Let me read it again if you're writing. This Hebrew word save, yasha, it means to be open, to be safe, to be free, also to defend you. Listen to this word, to preserve you and get victory. God says, I have victory for you. But it says there, his ear is not heavy, that he cannot hear. God's not deaf. He hears our cries and our prayers. Listen to this wonderful promise. It's not on the board. Psalm 50. You ought to write this down. Psalm 50, verse 15. I love this. Call upon me, capital M-E. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Hallelujah. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. Pretty clear, isn't it? And you shall glorify and praise me. What great promises they are. But verse 2 of this talks about but your iniquities have separated you from your God. <clears throat> and your sins have hidden his face from you that he cannot hear. See, God's position is, my arms are not short, uh, that I, I can save you, and then I'm not deaf that I can hear you when you pray and when you cry out to me. But I want to tell you something. There's something getting in the way. There's something that's getting in the way. Let me give you the definition of the word iniquity. And you'll want to write this down. The word iniquity, verse 2. The word iniquity says it separated you from your God. The word iniquity means perversity, which means evil. Perversity. It's an evil that has separated us from God. That he has hidden his face from you. And let me tell you what the two main things are. And the Holy Spirit can speak to your life. Here's the two biggies. 
disobedience and unbelief. Disobedience and unbelief are perfectly conjoined twins. They are carbon copy clones that are connected together. Again, disobedience and unbelief are the two main ones. Disobedience and unbelief. See, if you don't obey, you don't believe. And if you don't believe, you're going to not obey. You can't have one without the other. James says, let let none of you become just hearers of the word and not doers of the word. And then this is the words that he uses, deceiving yourselves. I can be <clears throat> self-deceived because I hear the word, I hear the word, I hear the word, I hear the word, but I don't do it. Are you hearing me? The problem with unbelief with Israel and the unbelief, listen, <clears throat> excuse me, always leads to fear. When we don't obey and believe God, fear comes in and that will control you. That will control you. See, Moses learned a tremendous lesson in that 11th chapter of Numbers. But, and Israel did too. But listen, we can learn something. We can learn something right now on August 7th in Lake Elsinore, California. You can learn something from them for your own life. Let me give you a testimony. Some of you know this testimony, but some of you maybe don't have never heard this testimony. 1972, Carol and I have been married almost a year. We got married June 5th, and this was like May 2nd. May 2nd, I'm working at General Electric. We lived in an upstairs apartment. We furnished an upstairs apartment. I had a 59 Volkswagen. She had a 64 Valiant, black and pink. And I had an old brown 1959 Volkswagen. Geared very low. <clears throat> and I get my leg broken at my job. Snap the ankle right in half. Tibula and fibula. So I'm walking around with a casket up to here. Not a casket. It was like a casket. A cast. Big old cast. And my legs are not exactly little. On crutches. They came out with polyester pants. I was happy. I would stretch that polyester pants over that casket. You should have seen it. 500 PSI. I mean, it was just... And we didn't wear shorts to church back then. Some reason God's church we were going to. So I broke my leg and I was out of work from May to January. Long time. We moved back in with her mom and dad. Had a bedroom and we stayed there. And she went to work at General Telephone. And I was off on disability. I almost got hooked on soap operas. The Bible says confession is good for the soul. God did some miracles during that time of having a broken leg and making $88 a week disability. $88 a week. And so we wanted, you know, we were there for about a month and we decided, you know what, let's get a hold of a realtor and let's see if we can't find a house to rent. I mean, like I said, we were uh, 21 years old. And all of the little bit of furniture we had and stuff was in storage in her mom and dad's garage and there we were living there and it was just, she would go to work and there I would be. My father-in-law, my mother-in-law and me and a black and white TV. And the lady that was a realtor said, why don't you try to buy a place? And we thought, how could we do that? I'm making $88 a week on disability. Carol they would work, but they would only take half of a woman's salary. They wouldn't take the whole salary even though she'd be working 40 hours a week. That's just the way things work. 
So we went to look at this house, and uh, first of all, the guy came down a thousand dollars on the price because we could only afford so, so uh, afford so much money with being newlyweds and everything. And he came down a thousand dollars so we could we could get an FHA loan. And like I said, this is brand new. Uh, we're just we're in uncharted waters. And we were going to the Assemblies of God Church, and we, uh, let me just tell you this, $100, six, it, it was going to take $600 for a down payment for an FHA loan for what we were going to do, $600. And I want to tell you something, $100 was $100 back at that day. And so we had saved our money, and we had $100. And our friends, Bill and Pam Winton, and their, I believe, four children. He had a 1964 Mercury with the big 394 Ford engine in it. And we were going down the 57 freeway for something I don't know. So Carol and I were following them. I put my big old leg into the car, crutches in the back seat. And we're following them on the 57 freeway for something. He had a lot of miles on his Mercury. Four kids in the back. And God spoke to my heart while we were on the 57th freeway. And these are the words that I heard. His engine's going to blow up in a minute. You're going to see black smoke. And when you pull over, I want you to give him that $100 bill in your pocket. Right. That's over a week's pay. So it happened. Black smoke started coming out. We stopped at a gas station. They're ahead of us. He raises the hood. The kids are there, the wife, Bill. And we pull up, you know, hop along, follow Carol, and we go over to them. And he's shaking his head because he's got four kids. And he was a mechanic for J.C. Penney's, and they didn't make very much money. And I said, Bill, you're not going to believe this. Well, here's what happened. We're in the car and the black smoke comes out. I said, Carol, God told me that this was going to happen and that we're supposed to give the $100 to them. And she said, Jim, are you sure? <laughs> Anytime your husband wants to take over a week's pay and give it away, you should say, are you sure? <laughs> and that was peace to her when I said yes. Because she was trusting my leadership to hear from the Lord. And I was a pretty new Christian. But this was huge. This was one-sixth of my down payment for that house. We hobbled up to him and I said, Bill, you won't believe this, but God told me this was going to happen. Your engine's going to blow up. And here's a $100 bill. His mouth dropped. And he looked at her. She started crying. I think for just a few bucks more, he completely rebuilt that engine. And so we were without $100 bills. We needed $600. And God, we're going to trust you. See, that was my seed. That was my sacrifice, being on disability. And we only had so much time to come up with the money. Es escrow and everything else. Well, to make a long story short, God gave us $600 that we could put down to buy our first home. I share that story with you because I believe there's a lot of you in this room have had that you have similar stories of faith. And God did it for us. And I want to say this. The big elephant in this room, the 800-pound Gorilla or the huge elephant in this room, if we can be honest, is money. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching to you. Is it true? Money. Money is the big 800-pound gorilla that's in your spiritual house that you're wrestling with. My answer to you is this. Is the arm of the Lord shortened towards you? 
is the arm of the Lord somehow been cut off from working in your life? The answer is no. I want to say this to you as I close. And I hope you'll write these things down. Belief is the antidote to doubt. Belief or believing is the antidote to doubt. Trust is the byproduct of faith. Trust is the byproduct of faith. Peace is the reward of surrendering everything to God. Peace is the reward of surrendering everything to God. Believing what God said will starve your fears. I want to say it again. Believing what God said will starve your fears. And lastly, the promises in the Bible are available and true to those who believe him. I want to say it again. The promises in the Bible are available and true to those who believe him. As we close this morning, God said to Moses, Is my arm too short, Moses? Now you will see what I will do. Now you will see what I said I will do. That's living in faith. That we realize God is not changed. God is not limited. God is not holding back. You know who holds back the blessings of God? We do. Because we will listen to the voice of fear and self-sufficiency. And I'll say it because it's just reality. The big elephant in the room is money. We still have a hard time trusting God. That somehow if we give away to God and put Him first, somehow the arms of the Lord have gotten short towards you. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? Not only for this matter, but for all matters, the arm of the Lord is not short, that He cannot save. But will I listen to the voice of fear? Or will I release my faith? And it could be on any level. Money, healing, relationship, trusting God for the future. The arm of the Lord is not too short that he cannot say. But you've got to believe it, and you've got to say it, and you've got to know that God has a good future for you. That lesson that Carol and I learned, I asked her the other day in preparing for this. I said, honey, tell me some of the faith stories that we have walked together for 45 years as husband and wife. And she said, Jim, the one about the house, our first house, is the biggest one. But there's been other tests. And I want to tell you, you're going to be tested. And the enemy's going to be there to tell you that you just can't do it. Why don't you just play it safe? Play it safe. Just chill out. Relax. Play it safe. But our God, who loves us and who has called us, says, I want you to know that if you will begin to live by faith and obey me, there are rewards. 
Moses with his frustration of being the only one trying to take care of a million and a half people, God said, I'm going to anoint some elders to help you. God, I want to kill myself or you just kill me and take me home. I can't do it. Some of you get so depressed at times and so fearful like I just don't want to live anymore. Don't do that. God's got good things for you. And you can win that victory over despair and fear and discouragement and hopelessness. But here's the big thing, and I read it to you about the whole issue about surrender. Let me read these things to you again. Belief is the antidote to doubt. Trust is the byproduct of faith. Peace is the reward of surrendering everything to God. Believing what God said will starve your fears. And the last one. The Bible promises are available and true to those who will believe them. I want to encourage you on this. We enter our eighth month of this journey called 2016. The Bible says four times, the just shall live by faith. Who is the just? Those who have been justified by the blood of Jesus and our position in him. Every one of us have been justified before God. The just shall live by faith. Will the just live by feelings? Will the just live by your understanding? Will the just live by having everything figured out? Or will the just live by faith in God? I think you know the answer. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you areas that you need to continue to be faithful in. And I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning that there's some areas that you need to step out in faith. But let me tell you, faith and obedience are connected. Faith and obedience are connected. Well, I'm waiting for God to speak to me. Well, he has a book that he's already spoken to you. You know, there's no problems of mankind, of relationships with you and another person, or you and God, or just life itself that God hasn't already given you an answer to. It's already happened. I don't need, you know, if I only had one thing to read it on my whole life, for the rest of the, my life, just give me the Bible. Peter Sabanda, our good brother in Zimbabwe, he was an illiterate man, had some learning difficulties, and could not read. And one of the problems was he had smoked so much dope before he became a Christian. It had affected his mind. When he got saved, he asked the Lord to help him. He didn't have anybody. And do you know, God showed him how to read the Bible and understand it. You'd never know that he had such learning difficulties and the problems that he had before he became a Christian. As we close this morning, I want to encourage you. There are faith rewards if you'll just be faithful to God. There are rewards of faith if you will step out and trust Him and believe Him. For whatever area of your life, whatever the area is, step out in faith. Believe God. Because God, what God said to Moses, and what God said through Isaiah is God's arm shortened toward you. And the answer is no, no, no. Amen. But if there's some iniquities, there's some sin, you need to cast it down this morning. You need to cast down fear. You need to cast down unbelief. You need to cast down disobedience. Because a lot of us are holding back blessings because we just won't obey. Jesus wants you all the way. He is Lord of everything of you. 
Amen. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How could we pray with you today of an area where you would like to release your faith or an area that perhaps you've been disobedient to the Lord and you say, you know, or even just find a place in the altar and say, God, you love me so much this morning, you nailed me. Holy Spirit, you nailed me. And I have been walking in fear and not in faith. I've been walking in disobedience rather than obedience. If that's you today, Pastor Mike, Carol, Maria, and Glenn are here. We'd love to pray with you, but it might mean that you just need to find a place to pray yourself. Church, let me tell you, this is a big deal. This is a watershed moment right now. God's ready to open up heaven to do what he wants to do in your life, but he can't if those iniquities, those hidden things, are not laid at the altar and repented of. Amen? Is this the word of God today? Did we hear the word of God? Father, we praise you. We thank you for your love for us. Your grace and your mercy towards us. That God, as you spoke to Moses and you spoke to the children of Israel, God, we want to learn, even from their example, your arm is not too short that you cannot save. Your ear is not deaf that you cannot hear. But God, we need to step out in faith and believe you. And we need to repent of those attitudes that even control us because they've gotten such a stronghold on us. We have learned to walk in just an existence without walking in faith and obedience. And we wonder why the joy is not there like it should be. Father, help us this morning. Forgive us, cleanse us, and encourage us. We've heard the word of the Lord. I've heard the word of the Lord this morning. We've heard the word of the Lord. Now we know how to walk. And we can truly say with our testimony, God's arms are not too short. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, the people said, if you'd like prayer, please come up. Pastors, would you come? You need to find a place to pray. Find that place to pray right now. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night. Sign up if you have not signed up.